when you decided to step into this calling called making disciples, you signed up to be a fighter. Stop being surprised that things are going wrong. Stop being surprised that there's opposition. Start expecting it. So if you're just joining us this for the last month, we're, we've been in this four-week series called Second Timothy, uh, very creatively uh, named. And, uh, you know, when we were talking about this series, we thought, you know what? What we're feeling right now is we don't need cute, we need real. And so we said, let's just spend four weeks doing a four-week Bible study through the book of Second Timothy, four chapters in the book, four weeks, and so now we are to the final week. And so I'm going to tell you like I have um, and Doug has been doing the, the previous three weeks. The idea is that, that you wouldn't just come here and listen to us tell you what we got out of reading the chapter, but that you would do the same thing for yourself. So the homework again this week for all of you is, my, my challenge is go read chapter four of 2 Timothy. Just read it over and over and over and just get something to write with. Every time you crack open your Bible, just say, God, would you speak to me? And then start writing down the thoughts you get. And I'm telling you, a week goes by, and you're going to be amazed when you look back. You're going to see how easy this actually is. You're going to realize, I can get in God's Word, and He actually does speak to me. And that's the plan. That's the purpose of this whole series. And so today we are at chapter 4, and like we've been doing, I'm going to share with you what I got out of chapter 4, but then what would really be fun is for you to go spend this week in chapter 4 and see what God says to you as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's such a church thing. Who does that? <laughs> Amen. Um, okay, so we're going to read an epic part of Scripture. Um, so this is really cool. So, so, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote like almost a third, I think, of the New Testament, like a lot. All right. And this is his very last letter. He's writing from prison. He's already been to trial. He knows he's about to be executed. So this is the very last letter that he ever writes to us in the Bible and we are on the very last chapter of the very last letter. And the, the three verses that jumped out to me were his very last charge. So this is literally the last thing he says, if you go live like this, it's the last piece of advice he gives us. So this is super epic. I love it. Second Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. In, in the Old Testament, when they would do um, sacrificial uh, ceremonies in, in worship to God or to atone for sin or whatever it was, they would oftentimes take a glass of wine at the end and they would pour it out at the end of the, of the ceremony, and, and that represented that, the, the, that it's over, that we are at the end. And so that's what he says. He's like, my life is at the end. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also any of you, all who have longed for his appearing. I love this scripture because we, we see this guy at the end of his life, and he's looking back, and he's talking to his friend Timothy, and God is now using it to talk to all of us. And you can just tell, like, there's no pity party going on here. There's no poor me, oh my gosh, I'm still in prison, I'm about to be executed, please feel sorry for me. There's none of that. There's this, you can sense there's this pride, there's this satisfaction, um, there's, there's no regret. He's, he's, he's like, I left it all on the field. I fought the fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Now I'm about to go stand before Jesus and hear, well done. I've lived the greatest life I could ever dream of leaving, living. And he says, I want that for you, Timothy. And God says, Red Rocks, I want that for you. I don't want you to get to the end of your life and look back and go, I wish, wish I would have. Wish I would have been generous. I wish I would have built God's kingdom. I wish I would have taken some risks. I wish I would have hung in there. Like, he doesn't want that. We don't want that for you. And so, so he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And I kept the faith. So as we start today, I want you to just kind of ask yourself a question. What are you, right now, what are you fighting? What are you fighting for? What are you fighting against? Because we're broken people living in a broken world, which means we're all fighting something. It's just how life works until heaven. For some of you, maybe it's, I'm fighting for freedom from things like anxiety and depression and insecurity and loneliness and self-doubt. For some of you, 
Maybe you're, you're fighting for a loved one, for them to experience some freedom, for them to find Jesus, for them to experience life change. Maybe some of you are praying about starting a family. Maybe some of you are fighting to keep a family together, fighting for your marriage, fighting for a dream, fighting against the diagnosis, whatever it is. Like, this is us, right? And what happens is, is life happens and we get tired and sometimes we get discouraged and sometimes we get frustrated. And what we're tempted to do is if not permanently, at least temporarily, just sort of give up. I'm just done. I'm done praying for this because look, nothing's happening. I'm done trying to trust God because look around. It's not working. I'm, I'm done believing that he's got something. I'm done trying to obey. I'm done giving, serving, showing up, inviting people to church, sharing my faith, sharing my story, taking what God has given me in my life and turning around and trying to make a difference in this world and share it with somebody else. Like nothing's going my way. I'm done. You ever felt that? I know I have. If you've ever felt that, today's for you. And, and Paul's writing to Timothy because that's exactly how Timothy feels. He's struggling. I, I talked a little bit about this in week one, but Timothy is now the, the senior pastor of a church in Ephesus. And so if you ever read the book of Ephesians, that's a letter that Paul's writing to that church in Ephesus, and now Timothy's the pastor. When I say that, I used to picture this. I mean, maybe a smaller scale, Maybe not this many cameras. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Like, but at least one side screen for sure. And <laughs> guys, this is an underground church that's meeting illegally because if anyone finds out that they're meeting about Jesus, they could be executed. It's crazy. I mean, you want to talk about pressure. You want to talk about problems. You want to talk about trying to do something that feels impossible. And not only is that not hard enough by itself, but now there's people in the church that are against him and they don't agree with his theology and there's false teachers and some false doctrine going on and they're thinking things like you're too young, you're too inexperienced, you don't have what it takes, you can't do this. You know Satan's whispering in his ear like, listen to him, you probably are too young. This is crazy. Like if God was in this, wouldn't this be easier? Just stop, just throw in the towel, make life easy. And he's starting to feel these things and Paul knows it because in chapter one, Paul says, stop it. Stop it. You were not given a spirit of fear. That word actually means cowardice. It says, Timothy, stop. Stop acting like a coward. God put a fighter spirit inside of you. Now, you don't have a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Now, now if you want to experience the plans that God has for you, you're going to have to do what I did. And it starts with this. Fight the fight. He says, I have fought the good fight. Timothy, fight the fight. It's going to be a fight, but you can do this. Would you go ahead and put up that definition for fight? To engage in battle, attempt to defend oneself against or to subdue, defeat, or destroy an adversary. Just by Paul telling Timothy that this is what it's going to take if he wants to walk in the plans that God has for him, that this is what it's gonna take if he wants to have influence and make a difference in this world and build God's kingdom and make heaven more crowded. He's trying to say, Timothy, stop being surprised when things go wrong. You're in a fight. Stop being surprised when people don't like what you're doing. You're in a fight. Stop being surprised when somebody hurts your feelings. Stop being surprised when a situation looks like it's falling apart. You're in a fight. Start to expect this stuff. Opposition shouldn't be a surprise. You should expect it, right? What did Jesus say? He says, we're in a fight. He says, Satan came to steal and kill and destroy everything I want to do in your life. He said, I came to this world to give you life to the fullest. I got a plan for your life. I've got some purpose for your life. I got something that you can be a part of that's bigger than you. But you're in a fight, and, it, and it's, sometimes it's a spiritual fight. And there's a real enemy. We're not playing games. Jesus said, heaven's real. Hell's real, God's real, Satan's real. He's against you. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy everything God wants to do in your life. Timothy, Red Rocks Church, you're in a fight. Stop being surprised by opposition. You're in a fight. I was talking to a friend of mine who plays football for a living. And he's like, man, if this was God's plan, then like, why does it feel like everything's against me? 
And I said, I said, I said hey, you know how, um, you know how the, the other team double teams you a lot? Sometimes triple teams you? He's like, yeah. I said, you know why they do that? Because you're dangerous. If you were harmless, you'd feel little to no opposition. But you're dangerous to what they're trying to do. So there's going to be more opposition on your life. If you say, I'm going to spend my life trying to build the kingdom of God, you got to expect opposition. And the more serious you get about building his kingdom, the more Satan's going to have to push back. So the more opposition you're going to feel. We, don't, we shouldn't be surprised by it, church. We should start to expect it. You know when you should worry? is when you feel no opposition. Because to the enemy, you are harmless. If all you're doing is building your kingdom, no matter how successful you are, you may feel little to no opposition against the enemy. In fact, he's watching you going, go get him, kid. Build your kingdom. You're not hurting mine. But once you start saying, I'm going to make my life about building God's kingdom, oh, the enemy's going to start double teaming you. There's going to be opposition. We just got to start to expect it. We're going we're, we're gonna to have to fight through things like what other people think and say. We're going to have to fight through the lies. Uh, Jesus calls Satan the father of lies. He's going to whisper things in your ear like, you can't. You shouldn't. Look around. This is crazy. Nothing's working out. Here's, here's one of the biggest lies I hear. If God was really with you, would this be happening? You're going to have to fight through some of your own thoughts, some of your own feelings, because our feelings lie, Right? I don't feel like God's with me. I don't feel like God has a plan. I don't feel like God's working. Well, his word trumps my feeling, and his word says, in all things I'm working together for good for those who love him. And I do know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Right? So his word trumps my feelings. I gotta fight through my feelings. I gotta fight through the, the temptation to look at my situation and, and based on my situation, decide whether or not God's doing something. There is not one story in the Bible of anyone that you would go, I want to live like that. There's not one story of somebody doing something big for the kingdom of God where there was no opposition. Every single time there was a fight. And Paul's saying, Timothy, stop being so surprised by the fact that you're in a fight. You signed up for a fight. Of course there's going to be opposition. I, I, I like watching the, the UFC. Any, anyone in here like watching the fights? I heard three no's. <laughs> Very passionate one right over here. <laughs> Guys, you left me hanging. I know some of you watch these fights. I love it. My wife can't stand it. I love it. And I, and I, there's, I have a problem. Like, the, 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 the more damage that's done, the more I'm into it. I don't, pray for me. I don't know. <laughs> so I was thinking this week, though, because I, I, was, I was actually thinking this last night. I was watching one last night. What if, what if these guys got in the middle of the cage and, and the referee goes, fight, and they run at each other and one guy throws a punch and the other guy runs out. Ah, and he opens up the cage and takes his gloves off. He's like, ah. The coach is like, what are you doing? He goes, that guy tried to hit me. <laughs> when the coach would be like, why do you keep acting surprised that there's an opposition? You signed up to be a fighter. Paul's saying, Timothy, Red Rocks Church, when you decided to step into this calling called making disciples, you signed up to be a fighter. Stop being surprised that things are going wrong. Stop being surprised that there's opposition. Start expecting it. No, no, you watch a fight. These guys, they know I'm, I'm going into fight. And so you, you watch them. They're, they always go behind the scenes in the locker room, and they show footage behind the scenes, and they're back there with their coach, and the coach is back there. They're doing some final preparations, and the coach is reminding them, this is who you are, and this is how we've trained, and this is what you're capable of, and I'm going out there with you. And then they put on the fight song. <sighs> Ladies, you don't know this, but your husband has imagined himself making that walk, and he has a fight song. Oh, he's never told you about it. He has one. Ask him on the way home. Mine is TNT by ACDC or Marshall Mathers, because you, you got to lose yourself, you know what I mean, in the music, the moment. You own it. You better never let it go. You only got one shot. Do not miss your chance to blow. Opportunity comes. I'm looking at my son. He's going, stop, Dad, stop. That's my fight song. 
It's neither here nor there. And then you see them talking to themselves. My, my favorite female fighter is a girl named Rose. She's in Denver. What's up, Rose? Red Rock Church says, welcome home. And uh, she walks out and she goes, she walks up, she walks out and she goes, you can read her lips. She goes, I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm the best. Because her coach has told her so many times what she's capable of, she actually starts to believe it. And I started thinking, what if before we left our houses in the morning, we started leaving as if we were leaving a locker room preparing for a fight? What if we got in the word of God and let God the Father start to remind us who we are and what we're capable of and that he's going with us every single step of the way and we don't have to be afraid? And what if you threw some worship on and it became your fight song every single morning and you started to let those words get into your mind and into your heart and into your soul and then you started to talk to yourself? Yeah, when I hit my office today, when I hit my school today, there's going to be opposition but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm not avoiding opposition today. I'm expecting it because I'm in a fight. That's a different way to leave home right there, isn't it? Fight the fight. Finish the race. I have fought that fight, and I have finished the race. Paul says, listen, because there's opposition and because you're human, there's going to be times when you want to quit. And he says, but you can choose not to. You can choose to finish. A lot of people start, very few finish. He said, you want to experience everything God has for you? You got to decide. I know I'm stepping into opposition because I got a fighter spirit inside of me, and I can't choose whether or not I experience opposition, but I can choose whether or not I quit. I'm going to finish this race. Yeah, you ever have somebody, you're really struggling, and like life's really hard, and you're going through things, and then someone comes up to you, and they haven't gone through anything even close to this, and they're like, hey, listen, don't you give up. God's got a plan, huh? Huh? And you want to strangle them? You ever feel that? Because what you're thinking is, you don't have a clue what I'm going through. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what this pain is like. Don't you dare tell me to hold on. You can't really do that with the Apostle Paul. You can't really look at him and go, you don't know what I've been through. You haven't experienced pain like I have. You don't know what it's like to be me. You can't really do that with this guy. Some of you know a little bit about his story. Let me give you some cliff notes of some of the things he's went to, went through, and then ask yourself, you don't think this dude wanted to quit sometimes? He says, I've been in prison more frequently been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That's the floggings. They would, they would tie them up with their, their ribs exposed. And usually two people would get on, one on each side, and they would have these, long, these whips with these long leather straps, and they would have bone and lead in each strap. And when they would hit the side of your body, it would literally pull pieces of flesh off every single time, and they'd give them 39 lashes. They would be unrecognizable, and many people would die during a flogging. Five times Paul went through that. You don't think after the fifth time he went, maybe God's not in this. See, we got too many Christians today walking around going, I'm going to go make a difference for God. And then the first thing something goes wrong or somebody hurts their feeling, they start getting real spiritual, don't they? I just don't have the peace anymore. I think God may have closed the door here. Maybe God didn't close the door. Maybe you're supposed to get a spiritual sledgehammer and start fighting through some stuff. Start making a difference in this world with that fighter spirit, putting that fighter spirit to work. Five times that happened. Three times I was beaten with rods. I read about that this week. They would tie them with ropes like a straitjacket and often hang them upside down and beat them with iron scepters or birch poles or even tree branches and just beat them and beat them and beat them. And then towards the end, they would start to beat the tops of their feet, breaking all the bones in their feet and ankles so they couldn't walk. Three times. You don't think there was a time when Paul went, maybe this is a closed door. No. I can't choose whether or not I face opposition. I can choose whether or not I quit. 
Three times I was beaten with rods, once pelted with stones, three times shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day at the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from Jews, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled, and I've often gone without sleep. Guys, I've worked so hard. Sometimes I couldn't sleep. I've known hunger. I've known thirst. I've often been without food. I've been cold. I've been naked. And besides all that, I care so much about these churches. I got this daily pressure of all my concern for the churches. You don't think he wanted to quit? When that guy says you can finish the race, church, we can finish the race. I was literally working on this point in my office this week, and my assistant walked in, and we were talking about the calendar, and and then she just threw out this side comment. She went, oh, I'm running a half marathon this weekend, and I was like, I talk to you every day. I didn't even know you ran. She's like, oh, I run marathons. I'm like, what? She goes, oh, I'm, I'm awful at every single sport in the world. She goes, I just have this ability to not stop, and I wrote it down. Red Rocks Church, what if we started to tap into that God-given ability to not stop? I know there's going to be opposition. I'm in a fight, but I can choose to finish. I can choose to not stop. God says, let God, somebody needs to hear this right now because you're thinking about giving, you're you're thinking, I'm going to stop praying for this. I'm going to stop believing for this. I'm going to stop fighting this. Let God speak to you right now. Do not become weary. I know you're feeling tired. Get rid of that feeling. You can master your feelings. They don't have to master you. Do not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Paul says, Timothy, Red Rocks Church, I fought the fight. You're going to have to fight the fight. You're going to have to finish the race, and you're going to have to keep the faith. You know, the the oldest trick in the book for Satan to try to steal, kill, and destroy the destiny off of our lives is to whisper lies in our ear and try to get us to just stop trusting God. I think he's like, do whatever you want with your life. Be whatever you want to be. If I can just get you to start questioning God, if I can just get you to stop trusting God, I'll take away all the destiny on your life. It's the oldest trick in the book. I mean, go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, I mean, did he, I know, I know you've seen the words. I know you heard the word. Did he really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I mean, that doesn't sound right, does it? The woman said to the serpent, no, no, he said it. We, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say You must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Mm. I mean, come on, you're you're a realist, right? I mean, we live in the real world. That's that's not not gonna die. You certainly are not gonna die. The serpent said to the woman, see, God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and and you'll be like God, knowing knowing good and evil. I know the Bible says that, but come on, this is 2023, different time. All those promises that can't be for you today, that's his plan. You do not have to listen to those lies. God's word says, my word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. He says, it will equip you for every single good work I have planned for you. You do not have to listen to the lies of culture or the lies from the enemy or anyone else who tells you that you can't trust God or his word. You can stand on every single promise today and every single thing he said he means. We can trust him, church, but it's a choice. We got to make that same choice, and sometimes we got to make it when life feels like it's falling apart. That's what David had to do. David is on the run for his life from King Saul. And he says, be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit all day long. They press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. Like he's on the run for his life, scared to death. But when I'm afraid, here's what I do. I put my trust in you. It's when we're afraid that that choice has never been more important. I'm scared to death, so I can either stop trusting or I can lean harder into his promises. 
And David says, if you want, you can choose to trust God. And, and, and when you do that, Satan doesn't get to win. You get to win. But remember, you're in a fight, and this thing is real, and he wants you to lose. But you can choose to trust him. This week, I had a really cool conversation with a friend of mine who is trying to walk in what he feels like is his calling and trying to use his career to also build the kingdom of God. And, and over the last few years, went through some really hard times and felt like everything was falling apart. And he had to decide, will I or will I not continue to trust God? Because nothing is making sense right now. Watch this. Red Rocks Church, what's happening? Hey, uh, we are here with my friend and brother. And uh, this is not just a guest because he's good at his career. He is part of the Red Rocks Church family and newly a NBA Finals champion, the one and only Michael Porter Jr. What's up, Mike? Appreciate you for having me, bro. I want to talk to you about some of the stuff that you had to fight through to do what you're doing. And then we're going to talk about your faith a little bit. And my hope is that that our conversation will encourage a whole bunch of people in the church who are trying to walk in their God-given calling, but they're facing all kinds of trouble and trials and things don't look like they're gonna work out. Can you share just a little bit of your journey just to get to the NBA and to get to where you're at now as an NBA Finals champion? I remember in about eighth or ninth grade, I started being recognized kind of like nationally a little bit. And ever since then, all the way up until my senior year of high school, I just kept climbing the rankings until eventually I'm the number one player in the country and then went to college at Mizzou. My back had always kind of been bothering me um, the last couple of years. First game comes around and for some weird reason, my pain went from my back to like down my leg. We decided I needed surgery, so that knocked me out all the way until the NCAA tournament when I tried to come back. But in the process of coming back too early, I hurt my back again. At this point, I'm trying to decide if I'm gonna stay back in Mizzou or if I'm gonna, you know, go to the NBA. Decided to go to the NBA, but I'm still de dealing with all this pain. So end up having to get a second surgery. The draft process was, was a whole nother thing because I'm trying to work my way back. I'm trying to be a, a top pick still after all this stuff goes on. I have a pro day, which means all the teams come and watch you, watch you work out. I worked out really well. So now even through the first surgery, they're like, oh, he could be a top five pick. So my agent calls the top 10 teams in for a second pro day. The day before the pro day, um, that pain that I had that caused the first surgery, it happened again. So I ended up going to the, the workout and laying on a table, and the doctors from each of these teams are evaluating me. So you're laying on a table, and they're all coming up just to go, years. how screwed up is this guy? Exactly. Before we draft him. Before we draft him, and I remember- and you've already had one surgery? Already had one surgery. I hadn't okay. had my second surgery yet. And I remember the LA Clippers, uh, he was like one of the head docs in the NBA, and he came out with a report like, this guy may never play again. Um, and I saw that, every team in the NBA saw that. I get out to Denver and, you know, they evaluate me here, decide, you know, I need the second surgery. So I go get the second surgery and now it's a whole long year of, of rehab. My first year in the NBA, I didn't play, I didn't touch, touch the court. Second year, I played a little bit, then COVID happened. So COVID happened and the NBA shut down. This whole time I've been working, so I go out to the bubble and kind of finally you know, blossom a little yeah. bit. The Denver Nuggets blessed me with a huge contract. So for me, it was just way more pressure to, to be worth that. Cause I've always, you know, valued what others thought of me and yeah. things like that. I think that came from an early age, just feeling loved by being applauded. And that ne very next season that I'm, that I'm looking forward to proving that I'm worth this contract, boom. Same thing happens, I get hurt again. So I have the third surgery and that's just, you know, depleting because I've already had two. And now this is my third. So there was a lot of doubt. I know you got questions about that process, but that's kind of how I ended up here, working through all of those. And this is my first season back from those three back surgeries. And we wound up uh, NBA champions. Um, and it's a great feeling after all those things I've been through. When you were in that third surgery, because I remember talking to you right after that, how hard was it to keep trusting that God had a plan? My whole thing was I wanted to always reach my potential as a person. and and influence the world in a positive way. And I thought it was through basketball. The very first surgery, hearing that I had to sit the whole college season in that first surgery, because it was the first time I experienced some real tribulation. My whole basketball career was just like an elevator to success. When I got hurt, it was like I had to take the stairs now because it was just a slow process, learning to rehab, learning all these things. I didn't realize how vulnerable your back, your, your, your spine is after a surgery happens. That was a really rough point. And then I think that third surgery, I remember I recorded myself on my phone and was just telling myself like, 
God is gonna do something good. It may not be through basketball, but something good is gonna come with this. He didn't bring you this far. But I had no idea like what would happen. I really doubted that I could be back being a good basketball player. You definitely have those thoughts of, is there something wrong with me? Where's God? You know, I'm angry, I'm mad. Like, should I go a different route with my faith? Like, all those questions. Yeah. God gave me this, this singular focus and interest on basketball. So what, what will I do if this doesn't work out? And I think that that was the hardest part for me. I know you have tremendous faith in God, but you've been through hard times where it would have been easy to go, God's not helping me, so what's the point? What did you do to keep your faith, to keep trusting in God, even though your situation was not at all what you were praying for? The two most important things is, is that, that getting in the Word, you know, what I do with myself, but the other part is having people that you can really be open and honest with. Hearing your story, that's why we connected so much. When I heard how vulnerable you were up on stage about, I'm a pastor, but I still struggle with this, this, and this, that made me feel comfortable being like, I can get close to this guy because I'm an NBA player, I'm supposed to have it all figured out. Um, but I don't all the time. So I think that that's, that's the role that other people have. Life isn't about just it being smooth and reaching all your goals and accolades. Like I said, they, those things are very fleeting. So, and I don't really know if I'm supposed to say this, but this is a week now, this is Monday. So a week ago, we won an NBA championship. This last week has been, I've been struggling with a lot just, and then I'm kind of kind of sad afterwards. Cause I'm like, is that, is that all that really was? Like this last week- You must feel like a depression of like, I thought that was supposed to make me happier. I've been in my room just like thinking about that this last week, like, you know, wrestling with all those things in my head helped me realize, you know, whatever I go through, it's not gonna shake my faith because we're, we're gonna be somewhere for eternity. I want that place to be heaven. So whatever I go through, I'm not gonna let that change my faith in God. I love that. There's people watching this right now that are, they're like, man, I think I know what God wants me to do. I think I know what he's calling me to do, but it's not working out. It feels impossible. I'm looking at my situation and I'm like, this is not where I wanted to be at this stage of life. And sometimes it feels like God isn't with me. Sometimes it feels like God doesn't care. And what feels easiest right now is to quit. Either quit pursuing my dream or quit trusting God. What would you say to that person? You have those feelings, you have those emotions and no one is taking that away from you. But if you can put those feelings and those emotions aside, install discipline and things like that in your life and just don't quit, keep going after what you wanna go after keep believing in those dreams, keep trusting God. You will look back on your life one day and be happy you did so. Whichever direction God takes you, even if it's different than, than it looked, whatever it is, you will be happy you didn't quit and you, you will look back and just see all the blessings God brought because you didn't quit. I love you, bro. My boy. Thank you so much. I don't much. know if that was a good answer. That's so good. I love you so much, Yes, dude. sir. My guy. As a friend, I'm just proud watching him fight. But, but what I'm more proud of is the way he fights in an arena. See, we all fight. We just fight in different arenas. And like a whole bunch of us, he fights in, a, in an arena where God's not very popular. And his fight is to change that. And then I know that's a bunch of your fights. And when I asked that question at the beginning, what are you fighting against? I think that's when it started to feel real, like, wait a minute. This is me, and, and I am battling for something right now or for someone. And I know this because I've been there, and so have you. There are just those moments where you go, I don't want to give up, but I don't feel like I have the strength to keep going. You ever feel that? I want to believe. I'm just tapped out. I want to keep trying. I want to keep trusting. I want to keep obeying. I'm just I'm exhausted. This is your verse. Take this one home with you. On the day I called, you answered me. You emboldened me and strengthened my soul. Today, we're gonna call on the Lord and we're gonna say, God, I'm tired. God, I've been struggling. God, I need help. Would you embolden me and would you strengthen my soul so I can fight the fight, finish the race and keep the faith? Cause I'm a world changer. This message was super personal to me because um, I've been the senior pastor of this church for 18 and a half years. I have said the phrase, I quit, about 100 times. About five times I meant it, like meant it. Um, 
when we were two years in, we had our very first Easter service off campus, out of the theme park. And we went to the AMC Theater on the 16th Street Mall. And of course, in true Denver fashion, we had a blizzard on Easter. You can't trust our weather. We had 500 people show up for that Easter. And I, we, I remember thinking like, we're a mega church. This is crazy. It was such a great day. I went home feeling like I was the happiest pastor on the planet until I opened my emails. My email address used to be on the website. This guy ruined it. That's why it's not now. <laughs> he broke down my message point by point. I don't know who he was, but apparently he was there. Broke down my message point by point and told me how much of the awful job I did on each point. And I'll never forget the way he ended his email. He said, Red Rocks Church will never grow with you at the helm. He said, your lack of communication will be the ceiling for this church. You should quit. And I just started crying. And Satan started saying, I think he's right. And I started saying, I think he is. I wanted to quit so bad. We weren't even getting like full-time paychecks yet. We didn't even have health insurance. I'm like, I don't need this. I wanted to quit. Came close. About eight years in, um, I was going to take my very first ever sabbatical. Uh, it was, hey, you've been working here for eight years. We're going to help you take like a month off work. I was so excited. I thought, well, last day before I go on sabbatical, I'll just kind of wrap up a bunch of meetings. I had some people that had been waiting to meet with me. Last meeting of the last day before I go on this little vacation, and a guy comes in, and he's carrying a stack of papers. Looks like a teacher with like, I've graded my papers, that kind of thing. And he sat down and proceeded to tell me that God had told him to come correct me. And he had watched my last 10 sermons and taken notes on everything I had done wrong. And he wanted to help me understand why I was not helping people get to heaven. I went home, I remember the room I sat in when I put my head on Jill's lap like a little kid, crying, said, I'm done. I'm done, I don't need this. And then 14 years in, I started really losing a battle to uh, panic attacks. And I uh, checked myself into a seven-week anti-anxiety treatment center and some things happened while I was there, and I spent one night laying on a floor the entire night, couldn't get up. Told my wife and the owner of the treatment center I really wanted to take my own life. I was pretty sure I needed to quit. And uh, I sat in this room on Wednesday night of this week. I sat right back there, me and Jill. And uh, my son Ethan stood right here, and he preached to the youth group. And at the end of the sermon, he said, would anyone like to give their life to God? And a whole bunch of students started raising their hands. And so I'm back there just. And then he comes back, and I hug him, and he sees a boy who was visiting the youth group who had raised his hand but didn't know anybody, and he was sitting by himself. And my son went and sat with him through worship. And now I'm really bawling. And God whispered in my ear, aren't you glad you didn't quit? That's what he wants for every single one of us. There'll be little mile markers where we'll get that, where we'll get to look back and go, man, I made it through that season. Thank God I didn't quit. Another little season. Thank God I didn't quit. Can you imagine being in the Apostle Paul's shoes and getting to the end of your life with absolutely no regrets? I left it all on the field for God. I fought the fight. I kept the faith. I finished the race. And I'm going to see Jesus. That's the life he wants for us. That's how we go change the world. Would you stand up with me? Let's pray. God, I thank you that you're with us today. I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you care. I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us, even when we don't know what that is. God, would you remind us today, there's a fighter spirit inside. Greater is he who is within us than he that is in the world. And 
no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. And you will walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. And you will fight for us to give us the victory. And God, let that embolden us today. With everyone's eyes closed, I'm going to ask two questions and give you a chance to respond to what God might be doing in your life. The first is this. You, you, you say, I am battling either for myself or for a loved one. There's something going on in life. And today I want to say, God, would you embolden me and strengthen my soul because I'm not going anywhere. If that's you, raise your hand. I'm going to pray that God would begin to increase your faith. A whole bunch of us. Let's go. The second question is this. We've been talking about 2 Timothy chapter 4, but God's been talking to you about your eternal salvation. You didn't even know what you were getting into. You could just feel it. You can feel it in your heart like something's going on. That's, that's the God of the universe saying, my son died for you 2,000 years ago to pay the price for all of your sins. All you have to do is receive it. I want to forgive you of your sins, save your life, change your life, give you heaven forever. And you go, look, I'm not going to be perfect. I don't know how this is going to look, but I know it. I can feel it in my heart. Today is my day. Right now, I want to put my faith in Jesus, have him forgive me of my sins, and be on my way to heaven for all of eternity. If that's you, raise your hand right now. Raise it up high. I'm going to say a prayer for you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Oh my gosh. I see them all. I see you. I see you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Praise God. God, thank you for this moment. As we begin to worship you, God, I pray that people would feel like weights just come off their shoulders. A new sense of, of being emboldened and empowered and strengthened starts to take over. I don't have to quit. I don't have to give up. I got the God of the universe on my side. And I got that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead inside of me. Yes, I can get through this. I won't quit. I will fight the fight. I will finish this race. I will keep this faith. And God, I thank you for the salvations that are taking place right now, literally around the world. We thank you, God, as we worship you with music. May we just experience your presence in an extremely authentic way. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Church, let's worship.